into the call today. We have a lot of great information for you and uh, want to just get going uh, so we can cover it all. I don't see the mayor on yet, but we'll take folks uh, in the order that we can. I know both Susan and Margaret are also on our informa information rich call with the state. Uh, I saw them both on there, so I'm sure they're going to be joining shortly. Um, so I'm Chris Cooney with Metro South Chamber of Commerce. I want to welcome you. This is our 42nd week of these calls uh, that provides information uh, to businesses in the region about the latest going on with the city of Rockton. The mayor's been joining us every uh, for every call, as well as uh, two of our representatives from the Mass Office of Business Development and uh, Eli Spayo from the Small Business Administration. So as I said, there's a lot of new information. Before I, I get started, I just want to acknowledge um, our many partners who have uh, been promoting these calls. I'm not going to run, run down the whole list just to save a little bit of time because there's so much information in this call. Uh, but I do want to let you know that if you have a question, please post it down in either the chat or the Q&A, and our panelists will check on that and uh, move forward. Before we get um, going, I did want to mention that the Chamber has added uh, a part-time staff person to assist with uh, small businesses accessing assistance uh, through uh, SBA and the MOBD and uh, so many of our partners. So uh, Teresa Lobo Alban uh, speaks and writes Portuguese fluently. Uh, she's actually from uh, down in the Somerset area, Fall River. I think she was born and raised in Fall River. Um, and I say that because I know Ed Lambert is the former mayor of, uh, Brock, of uh, Fall River. And uh, so, but she's been with us uh, since February and now she, we've added hours so that she can talk with folks, especially Cape Verdeans who speak Portuguese uh, and she can assist them with their questions about uh, many of the programs that are available to uh, small businesses during this time. So it's great to see Eli uh, and the mayor. Uh, we have with us Joe Casey as well, and of course, uh, one of our speakers, Ed Lambert. So why don't we just jump right into it, Mayor? Uh, can you give us a sense of what's happening? What's the latest? I'm sorry, I caught you with probably the only sandwich that you're going to get all day today, right? It wasn't even a sandwich. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let's see, roll. Okay. That's all right. It's not keto friendly, so I shouldn't have it anyhow. Um, <laughs> so I, I welcome again, and thank you for having me on, Chris, and, and everybody from the chamber. That is just so responsive to my office. And Good to see Eli and Margaret, and I know Susan uh, as well. So um, I want to uh, I want to just give an update. I mean, COVID is still here. It's still in the city of Brockton. We're still losing people. We lost two overnight. We're at 361 dead in the city of Brockton, 361 residents. Uh, we're at 10,502 total cases overall since the state calculated. And currently, 2,549 residents have positive cases of, uh, of COVID-19. So I just got off a call before I joined here with the CEO at, at Brockton, Kim Holland and Sue Joss from Neighborhood and Matt Hesketh over at Good Sam and the VA. And we do it every Monday and Friday. And um, you know the census numbers over there are, uh, are high, very high, almost as high as last May. So a lot of sick people in the ICU. So what that means is we need to continue our efforts to be diligent and vigilant, um, control our own destiny with mask wearing and social distancing. Vaccine rollout last week for phase one in Brockton uh, was exceptional. We used Brockton High. Uh, Board of Health was notified by DPH that we'll be rolling out some additional uh, vaccines next week again, later in the week. So, um, you know, that's that's the promising news, Chris, in terms of the vaccine. Um, I don't care what party you are, the fact that there's a new president, we will get more money and more medicine in the city of Brockton, which is excellent. We need that. Um, I will be doing my first State of the City address next Thursday night uh, at 7.30. It will be aired uh, on Brockton Community Access and also on the city's Facebook page as well. Um, I had a wonderful conversation with a developer today and with the BRA, uh, someone not from Brockton that wants to invest a substantial amount of money here in the city downtown, which is just, again, wonderful. So it's a lot going on. There really is a lot of things in the queue. Uh, the biggest thing right now is to continue to get the investment, make sure the businesses are here, uh, make sure that they get the assistance that they need, and then also attract, attract, attract to help our tax base. Thank you, Mayor. Just two quick questions. One is on the access to vaccines for Brockton residents. Uh, is there a central site that's set up uh, and, and what's the best way for 
people to go ahead and yeah and actually when mayor jim harrington was mayor um, jimmy uh established a plan and i haven't changed it brockton high one of the largest public high schools east of the mississippi is the focal point that's the mass distribution site we used the red cafeteria last week the red library which is attached is the observation site if you're familiar with brockton high we have forecasts for libraries we're going to be utilizing all those when we do the citywide rollout uh however some of our seniors and our elders are not mobile they can't get to brockton high so we are working diligently with the Housing Authority and also with Neighborhood Health Center, Sue Joss and Dr. Maria Celli to actually go there. We were just on a call this morning trying to plan that out as well. So it's all hands on deck. Any help we can get with Brewster Ambulance and clinicians, school nurses have been wonderful, city nurses have been wonderful. So uh, Brockton High is the site that's gonna, not gonna change uh, as long as uh, we have the ability to give out the vaccine and save lives, Chris. Okay, second question. And final question uh, for this for today, uh, Governor uh, just uh, ended the curfew on restaurants and businesses uh, statewide. How does that impact Brockton's curfew? Is what's the status? Yeah, yeah, great, great point. I have it on my talking point. So the governor did issue that it goes into effect Monday, so they can stay open after nine thirty. I'm going to do a simultaneous. The city solicitor is drafting now. I'm going to be lifting my curfew as well. Uh, so, you know, Monday will uh, will be effective for both the governor's order and my mayoral executive order. And uh, again, we're just asking people to please, you know, control your destiny with the mask wearing. That's the, the biggest thing right now. There is a spike right now and it's attributed greatly to Christmas and Hanukkah and Kwanzaa. That's a fact. So we'll keep doing it. Great. Thanks so much, Mayor. Appreciate Thank you all. being here. So I want to move right on to uh, Susan Whitaker. I know both both of your names say Margaret for some reason. But uh, Su Susan, good to see you again. I know you were on the call with the, uh, the secretaries uh, today, uh, as was Margaret. Can you just share with us a little bit about what's going on on, yeah. on your end? Yes, so um, so I think, is, is has Margaret joined us on the call? I'm not sure if she's, if she's joined us yet. Um, Margaret's on the call, yes. Oh, good, okay. So, um, so, I'm going to give an overview for some unemployment. I think um, Lexi has the slides for us, but the Secretary Acosta shared that the unemployment rates for um, the unemployment numbers for the month of December, we experienced a bit of an uptake. So presently um, we're at 7.4%, which is above the national average, uh, which is 6.7%. And um, we lost a considerable amount of jobs as well. Um, the hardest sector that was hit, not surprisingly, is uh, um, leisure and hospitality, <clears throat> um, as well as government. Um, and then the jobs that sector that saw some some job growth were professional services and science. Um, so you know, I think um, the other feature that she, she that she highlighted was that. Um, the long-term unemployment people who are staying unemployed for the longest, the groups are um, women and um, people of color. So that's, that's very concerning and that the focus really is going to be now, how do we as the Commonwealth, we really need to ensure that we are providing the people who are experiencing unemployment now with the tools that they need and the training that they need in order to, to find uh, employment. So that's gonna be the focus um, for Secretary Acosta as well. Um, and then I can go through the additional updates. Um, the other thing that she did wanna call out and mention is that um, the um, PF, uh, PMFL is up and running and that they're getting um, a lot of, they had over 14,000 applications since January 1st um, and 24,000 calls. So um, so the, the paid family medical leave, um, so the one thing that she wanted to make sure that the employers were doing was to make sure that they went ahead and had a designated registered administrator in their portal, because if they don't, then that really slows down the process for them to um, to go through the paperwork and file this information. Um, additionally, they want to make sure that people are the people are aware that um, when they file the paperwork, that that they are required to get back 14 days 
after the employer responds, not after the employee files a claim. So um, I think people are, are expecting that there's 14 days once they file the paperwork, but it's actually after the employer responds to, um, to the claim. So um, if they can help get some help communicating that, and that also that employees only need to file one claim, not multiple claims. They just need to file one. So um, that was another additional update that she shared for the paid family medical leave, which is you know implemented now, which is brand new for um, January one. And then, okay. okay, so I think that we're that's the last slide we're seeing here. Just need to go back to the beginning. Yeah, that's important information because that is a new program starting in January uh, right. for the state of Massachusetts. So we're going to put a link to that so folks can uh, be aware of what's involved with making sure that you as an employer uh, are set up correctly and also uh, prepared if there is a claim uh, that needs to be verified. Uh, so that's great. Um, and then the other thing you, you mentioned, the slide was up there, was the the real relief that was provided in not allowing the unemployment uh, rate to go up on all these employers at the rate that they were talking about, which was possibly a 60% increase on unemployment across the board for every employer in the state of Massachusetts. They froze it, I believe, right? Well, uh, it's at the house and they've, they've refiled the bill. Um, so okay. it's at the house ways and means. So th that's the plan is to, to freeze the rate um, for two years. Um, so that, that we don't see that massive rate increase for employers. That's what we want to try to avoid. And they want to be able to bond the debt as well. Um, so that's the hope. And, and I don't think there's any real big concern that it won't pass, but um, that's, that's what's, so it's, it's, it's there now. So it's hopefully, um, hopefully we'll have so some updates. That is good news. And, and one of the updates I think that you brought to us a couple of weeks ago is that the, the bills didn't go out with a higher rate. Uh, only to be reversed. No, later on, no, right? they just, they're not okay. sending anything out until they hear back okay. on this. So it's it, everything's in a holding pattern until they hear back because they don't want right. to. They don't want to send out anything without knowing really what the status of this is. That's great. Thank you very much, uh, Susan, for that update. Yeah. We're going to go right to Margaret because, as I said, we're covering a lot of ground here today. Okay. So, uh, Margaret, how are you? I am great. I am pulling up another little slide deck here. Um, as you see, my first slide is going to be, hold on, um, is about registering the Paid Family Medical Leave Act, and we do have that link to get uh, get you registered. The other slides on the call with Secretary Keneally today, we, in addition to the updates Sue provided um, from Secretary Acosta for Labor and Workforce Development, we had um, Mary Lou Sutters from Health and Human Services. So the next three slides are going to be quick. I know we have some guest speakers. Uh, hello to Ed Lambert. It's nice to see our paths cross. Uh, in, in, in a new way. Um, so employer engagement. So you are going to be seeing, this is a, these three slides are going to be relative to vaccine rollout and what to expect from employers. So uh, this is a little bit of a preview, but launching February 7th is going to be in a public awareness campaign. And we're going to be uh, putting posting materials for distribution. These are going to be multilingual, very similar to the posters uh, for employers when you were doing your self-attestation, we're gonna be doing a marketing campaign, getting the word out um, so that the employers can be communicating, you know, and what to communicate to their employees relative to the phase in. There's also a really um, interesting opportunity for employers if, if they want to host an on-site clinic um, for their, to vaccinate their employees. So they can work with a partner wellness provider. And one of the things we had heard on the calls, they could even contract with their local pharmacy to do this on site for them. It doesn't jump you in the phases, right? It's you're in phase one, phase two, phase three, it's by worker groups, you see in phase two, a lot of frontline uh, service workers. And so um, when you're in your applicable phase, you as an employer could provide that. So where will, uh, the vaccine be administrated. You're seeing the mass vaccination sites for those who are in phase one. That's where we currently are. We have 7 million people in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, Secretary Sutter said that we are getting currently getting from the federal administration uh, 86,000 doses a week. So you can see, and you know, and it's a two dose vaccine. So you can see uh, we have a long ways to go for full vaccination. They are hoping to increase the supply uh, weekly from the federal uh, supply, but that's, that's the numbers as they stand today. So as 
they will be announcing additional, I think they're going to get five mass vaccination sites throughout the Commonwealth. You're going to see your retail pharmacies having these, your primary care medical, and then again, these employer groups. So it is going to be available when you are in your phase. So the, uh, you're going to be able to go to your primary care and get it. You can go to a CVS, you can go to an urgent care. And so uh, a little bit more on the vaccination option for employers. If you see, um, you obviously want to be encouraging them to use those mass vaccination sites. They're going to move through them quickly. They said when, you know, when you're scheduled to be there, it's uh, five minutes. But um, if you have an existing relationship, you can leverage that to host your on-site clinic. And if you're interested in doing that, uh, this poor Mary Joyce, she was on the call with us as well, but it's her email address that you're to contact. So these are really more for the, the larger employees that want to host something on-site. So wanted to make sure, hot off the press, that you have that information, more rolling out along that. Uh, but that is what I have for you today. And, uh, you know, Sue and I always welcome, we're here for Q&A and always welcome uh, offline communications for your company. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret, so much. Appreciate that. Uh, I know they talked a little bit about my local as well, which is uh, allowing organizations like the Chamber and other economic development agencies to access some marketing and branding uh, money to encourage uh, Massachusetts residents to purchase locally from your local uh, businesses. Yes, they are launching a new campaign and that may be something that the Metro South Chamber in partnerships with the city of Brockton and some of your nonprofit partners, some of your nonprofit tourism, like you know the Fuller Craft Museum, they always give a good shout out to here, um, can put together a grant application to the Mass Office of Travel and Tourism. And, and the other big, um, so that is coming soon. We actually also have a regional pilot grant program, our um, Office is going to be administrating is launching this week. And so I want to make sure Chris offline to get that to you because you are, as our regional economic development organization, a good candidate for that program uh, and for the community of Brockton. And also I should really make note, uh, LISC, L-I-S-C, Brockton has been providing technical assistance. You've heard me talk about them relative to the Mass Growth Capital Corporation grants. But uh, the newest hot topic that they're giving technical, free technical assistance, and this is in many languages, is PPP3. So I'll put that into the chat. Uh, the, it's the bit.ly link, and you can sign up, get free technical assistance, and they are really helping the smaller companies. Um, and, and we really want to get you connected to, to get that you know, access this money, it's there for you. We want to be able to provide you the support you need to get those resources. So I'll put that in the chat as well. Thank you, Margaret, appreciate it. We'll get the word out on that. On terms of the employers uh, to partnering, I know in past, uh, even the chamber has partnered. We're not a large employer, but we have a lot of smaller employers that come to events and whatnot. We had partnered with the Neighborhood Health Center to do uh, flu vaccines back uh, a while back. Uh, I wonder if that might be possible again, uh, and or if there's employers like Harbor One and, and others uh, with a critical mass of people, because uh, I think it has to be at least 200 doses, uh, that they can partner with a local entity and then have them come right onto the site, as you indicated. So we'll put that information down below as well, and that may be of interest to folks. Yeah, and I will say that's exactly, you're exactly the candidate. So if you've administered a flu clinic, sometimes, you know, if it's elder services or, or the senior center, you know, where it is in your community that can offer this, the people that you've gone to for a service like that with the, with the flu clinic, that's a perfect candidate for one of these locations. Great. Thank you so much. There's some uh, questions down below. I don't know if you've had a chance to take a look at those. There might be one in there for you, it looked like, for technical assistance or some state resources. Thank you very much. So I want to jump right over to Eli uh, from the Small Business Administration. We're getting so many questions about the new PPP and the EIDL, uh, the ERC now, I'm calling it the ERC, the Employer uh, Employee Retention Credit, uh, which is bigger than a lot of people realize. Uh, it could be 25,000 retroactive to last year and then additional funds for this year. Eli, take it away. Well, Chris, good afternoon and good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks again for having me uh, on, this, on this event. I do have a few slides, so I uh, just want to share that with everyone. But uh, I, I uh, just wanted to provide an update uh, for everyone on the call today with regards to where we stand here in the state. So uh, as, as folks know, we have uh, we started the PPP program, the, the first draw and second draw uh, applications. Uh, we started accepting those on the 11th and the 13th initially for the community financial institutions. 
Uh, we opened it up to small lenders last Friday, lenders with a billion dollars in assets or less. And then as of Tuesday the 19th, the program opened up to, you know, uh, to all lenders of all sizes. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I um, just had to share this wonderful, you know, um, disclosure here from our legal team. As you know, nothing uh, in, in federal government happens without a little, you know, legal intervention. Uh, but, you know, in a nutshell, we have about 7,500 loans approved to date. Um, now, when you compare that to 118,000 we had over the spring and summer, that's a small number, but you have to remember this program has only been open to all lenders for four days. So it's pretty impressive of, of those numbers. You know, those are all funded loans. Uh, the systems are working well. You know, lenders are able to approve loans. Um, you know, of all those submissions, almost 6,900 of those loans. Um, so our second draw PPP loans, and that's what, what we anticipated. Obviously, definitely a lot more second draw PPP loans than, than first draw PPP loans. Uh, but I do, you know, I do want to share with everybody a quick update here for all the programs we have available. And uh, we have received a lot of guidance, Chris. You, you probably have followed, you know, the, the publications, the press releases. Just in the last two weeks since January 6th, you know, when we first announced the, the rollout of the program, we've got, you know, well over 400 pages of of new information between procedural notices, IFRs, and, and so on and so forth. You know, it's it's just not enough time in the day to absorb all of this information. So, um, you know, this is a great opportunity for, for, for us to share some updates, you know, relevant updates with, with folks. So uh, this is pretty self-explanatory. Everybody knows how much funding we have available. Um, we got some clarity on the idle advances. Uh, the, the last call that I participated, you asked the question about how this new program is going to look like. So I uh, definitely want to share a few uh, a few updates on that. Uh, so we, we covered the rollout of the program. Obviously, we do have a focus for underserved markets, minority, you know, women-owned, veteran-owned businesses. Now they can apply through any lender of any size, uh, whereas initially it was, you know, folks could only apply through CFIs. Um, but with regards to, you know, the, the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant Program, this is a brand new grant program, uh, $15 billion, uh, 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 you know, nationwide. Uh, of, of that amount, $2 billion is a set aside for small employers um, under this category who employ no more than 50 full-time uh, employees. So uh, not a whole lot of details yet uh, with regards to the rollout of it. But we held our first webinar uh, last Thursday, and um, you know the agency is going to be you know rolling out some new information until the, the program is officially launched and announced. Chances are that this is going to be administered by SBA Direct, so there's not going to be a lender involved on this program. One word of caution for uh, folks who believe that they may, may be eligible for a shuttered venue operators program. If you applied for a PPP loan during uh, spring and summer of 2020, you may be eligible for both the PPP and the SVO uh, grant program. But for new applicants uh, during this round of PPP funding, we are cautioning uh, folks to, to really do their homework and their, their due diligence because you cannot apply for both. So one is exclusive of the other. If folks apply for a PPP loan for this round of funding, they will be ineligible for the SVO grant program. Mind you, they're both grants, right? But you know, definitely there has to be some due diligence, some, you know, some numbers crunching on the part of, of the business. Uh, with regards to the idle advances here uh, that I, I, I mentioned earlier, so um, I, I believe you asked the question last time and, and um, you know, the guidance we had was incorrect. So just wanted to, you know, to, to provide a quick, over, I mean, uh, a quick update here. So for folks who did not uh, receive an idle advance, first and foremost, uh, those who applied, you know, after uh, July 11th and did not receive a uh, idle advance, SBA is going to be basically going back, you know, to those applications in the order received and obviously prioritizing applicants in low to income uh, communities. Okay, so first and foremost, for those borrowers in low, uh, to, uh, low income communities, you know, we are, for those who received an idle grant, but they did not receive the full $10,000, 
we're going to go back and uh, make them whole for the full $10,000, no matter how many employees they have. Okay. Uh, obviously, you know, priority is given to those businesses that can show at least a 30% economic loss as measured by gross sales year over year. Uh, but uh, again, uh, the, there's, there's, no, uh, there's not a whole lot of details, uh, Chris, on this. So, and, uh, That's great new information. That's, that means a lot to small businesses. We have quite a few call, uh, callers or Zoom participants today that are in Brockton that will qualify for yep. that remaining. Yeah, thank you Absolutely. for bringing that up. And, and the other thing too is we're, gonna, we're developing, we're in the process of developing a mapping tool so borrowers will be able to go you know, on, on online, uh, just plug in their address and, and you know, they will, uh, they'll know right away if they're eligible or not. Okay. And then obviously, you know, we're going to be reaching out proactively to, to those applicants who, uh, who would have been eligible, but we just didn't have funding available uh, for them. So Eli, will those funds just show up in their account? Uh, if they were, if they say they had 3000 the first round and now they're in a low moderate income area and they're going to get the other 7,000. Uh, will that just show up or will they get an email or, or what will happen? So, so we're, we're working on the details because as you remember, we had a lot of fraud the last go around okay. and the agency is making sure that, you know, we're validating the information. So this, this time around, we're, uh, we're implementing a, a few layers of security. Okay. So it's still work in progress, you know, so I, I, I don't want to disclose any details that are not made public yet. Okay. But fine. even with the PPP loan program, you know, the agency is doing the due diligence that we would do on the back end with a forgiveness process. We're okay. doing that upfront. And that's, that's the reason for, you know, a short time lapse between the time uh, lenders submit an application to the time that, you know, they receive a PPP loan number for their borrowers. But, uh, you know, great, great news with regards to our traditional loan programs. So we've got a couple of enhancements for our 7A Express and 504 loan programs. So uh, some of the changes are statutory, others are subject to funding availability. Uh, I, I mentioned in one of the slides earlier that we only got $2 billion for this part of, of the, this section, I should say, of, of the legislation. And um, the Guarantee increases are statutory, whereas the fee waivers are subject to funding availability. So we have not disclosed yet, you know, how far the funds are, are you know, really going to stretch and how much we can uh, do as far as fee waivers. Uh, same thing goes for the debt relief program. So we, we uh, sent out guidance yesterday to lenders with regards to the debt relief program. Uh, some of this is statutory, other parts of it are subject to funding availability. So until we hear back from OMB as to what we have available, you know, we, we won't know for sure, right, how, uh, <clears throat> especially with regards to, you know, the additional five months of, of principal and interest or, or the three months uh, of principal and interest for all, you know, existing SBA borrowers. But this is, you know, this is what we've got now. Um, and most importantly, uh, it's the, uh, the 1099, the taxation of debt relief payments received in 2020. So that was resolved. That's been you know, publicized and, and uh, borrowers will not receive a 1099 from their lenders for uh, payments we made during 2020 on their SBA loans. We've got quite a few updates on, on the forgiveness side, Chris, and, and I know time is, is short today, but obviously, you know, uh, I'll, I'll be sharing more information as this becomes available. So we published, you know, an IFR on, on forgiveness. We, uh, we streamlined uh, forgiveness for loans under $150,000. The new application is out there. And uh, one thing that I do want to point out is Although borrowers don't have to submit any documentation with regards to PPP loan forgiveness for loans less than $150,000, they still have to retain documentation on their loan, uh, on their files, right, on their, uh, for their records. And they may be, you know, loans, you know, will be picked at random to, to be reviewed. So that doesn't mean that they don't have to have documentation. They simply don't need to submit it to their lender of record. So, um, Important I, I, note of caution. That's good. Exactly, exactly. So um, I, I have a lot more information, but I know we don't have time. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that, and, and, and I'll wait if we've got any questions at the end. 
All right, Eli, thank you so much. I, and I know uh, you'll be back on the 4th, I think, is it the 4th or 5th uh, with us? Uh, and I'm expecting there'll be a lot of new information at that uh, one as well. So uh, we, we can parcel it out. I also know that you've got some updates that come along. Uh, you can send them to us and we'll send them out to the group. We have now over a thousand people who have attended these uh, these sessions since we started. So we can just send it out, uh, broadcast it to all of them and they can take a look at it. And then maybe we'll have more questions in the next uh, round uh, on the fifth, I believe it is. So thank you very much, Eli, I appreciate right. it. Anytime, Chris. Thank you. So I want to uh, now, uh, again, just introduce Teresa Albin, uh, Lobo Albin, uh, who is the woman that I mentioned earlier, who has a degree in accounting from UMass Dartmouth and uh, is doing work for the chamber, but also available to assist uh, folks, uh, both in English and Portuguese, with uh, information regarding uh, access to small business and MOBD and other uh, resources. Uh, she's a good listener and she'll uh, be able to kind of connect you with uh, a lot of the resources that are in the state. So uh, just give a wave, uh, Teresa. All right. Hello, Th thanks for being on Thank the, you. Thanks for being on the call. Uh, I'm now going to, it's my pleasure to introduce the chairman of our board. Uh, Joe Casey is the president and COO of the uh, Harbor One Bank, which is uh, the largest bank located, uh, headquartered in the city of Brockton, but servicing um, the entire state and beyond. And uh, they're also a major employer in our area. Uh, Joe has been very active in the community uh, the last uh, 20 years or so, and uh, very active with the Chamber of Commerce and the business community in particular. And we were very delighted uh, when he said he would uh, agree and accept a uh, leadership role of the Chamber. So uh, Joe's here to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, he's going to talk about a very important issue, which is education and its impact on business, especially during this time of COVID. Uh, Joe? Oh, yeah, you might be on mute, Joe. Lexi, can you, can you help him? Uh, is your volume on? You might need yeah, to he's, click on he's that. unmuted. It's just uh, technical difficulties. Sorry. Oh, there you go. There you go. We just heard you. Oh, good. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, thank you very much, Chris. Um, I, I do appreciate the opportunity. And thank you to all the uh, members and uh, participants on the call. We uh, really are excited about our, our guest speaker uh, today. Um, as you all know, this pandemic has really had a profound impact on many areas of the economy, but you know, especially education and uh, learning among our young students in our public schools. So we are very pleased to have a subject matter expert on our call this afternoon. It's, it's my pleasure to welcome our guest speaker, Ed Lambert. He's executive director of Massachusetts Business Alliance for Education. Before joining MBA in January of 19, Ed served as vice chancellor for university relations at UMass Boston, where he was responsible for government and community relations, corporate relations and communications. Ed was founding director of the Urban Initiative of UMass Dartmouth, a research center focusing on urban policy and leadership issues. There he helped organize the state's Gateway Cities Coalition and assisted in designing and implementing state programs and legislation to support them and led the initiative's work on urban schools, assessing practices and serving as a regional satellite of the National Dropout Prevention Center. He has taught public policy and public management, served as the chairman of the Education Policy Committee of the Kaput Center for STEM education and research. Ed's record of service also includes seven years as a member of the Massachusetts House of Representatives, where as a member of the Education Committee, he has assisted in the creation and passage of the 1993 Education Reform Act. He co-chaired the legislature's literacy caucus in support of increased funding for adult basic education and literacy programs. He's also served 12 years as the mayor of Fall River, initiating a comprehensive school building campaign, creating a series of community education summits. He served 22 years as the Fall River School Committee on the Fall River School Committee, 
earning himself the Massachusetts Association of School Committees Lifetime Achievement Award. Ed served eight years as a mentor to at-risk youths in the SMILES mentoring program. He also served on the National Task Force for the Development of the 21st Century Workforce of the Urban Serving Universities. Ed, it's all yours. Thank you. So oh, thank you very much. And if all that's on the MBA website, we've got some editing to do. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. And I want you to know, I love that tie you're wearing right there. Thank you. Um, and uh, uh, my congratulations, though, sincerely to you as chair and, and to Chris to be able to, uh, uh, at these busy times for political leaders to get the mayor uh, to, um, uh, to be with you, to give an update uh, shows, I think, the respect that your chamber has in the community in the region, and in particular, the, the role that chambers have taken on over the last 12 months uh, during this pandemic has been incredibly vital to your members. So uh, to you and, and to everybody on the call, thank you very much for your, your sure. commitment to the work that you do uh, in the region and also your, uh, your commitment really to education uh, to, to uh, be interested in this topic. So I thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen or attempt to do that uh, as, as have all of you become a bit of a, or try to become at least a bit of a Zoom expert. So uh, we'll see if we can manage some of that um, going forward here. So again, thank you all very, very much. You know, as, as Joe said, the, the impacts to education have been pretty incredible uh, during this time. Uh, we know, uh, of course, that it pales in comparison to um, the health and safety issues that families have suffered, the income uh, uh, in, income in, impacts that, that folks have suffered, but longer term, uh, the, the results of this pandemic could well be realized in terms of what it has meant uh, for a generation of students who have in many instances uh, been seriously uh, set back. We know the pandemic has, has had uh, unequal, uh, uh, unequal impacts. Uh, we know that for a lot of students uh, up to one two years of lifetime earnings potentially has been lost. Uh, studies have shown uh, that just uh, uh, going into the fall, almost 12 months of learning uh, has been impacted uh, by so many uh, students. And what we're trying to suggest, MBAE as an organization and, and the business leadership in Massachusetts in particular is um, that we can't just return to the status quo. It, it can't be enough for us to say there's a vaccine, we're gonna open the doors and we'll just get back to business as usual. Uh, there has to be a significant recovery effort uh, to bring students back on track, to assess where they're at, to uh, come up with strategies that accelerate their learning and bring them back to where they were and put them in a better position uh, than they were before. And we know that that's going to be challenging, especially for first, second, and third graders, uh, many of whom have had their reading instruction uh, disrupted. And we know that you need to be able to read on grade level to learn. Uh, and interestingly enough, on the other end of the spectrum, are those students who are in the latter stages of high school, uh, whose launch into either college or career have been most severely impacted by this pandemic as well. Just a quick look at some of what uh, happened nationally in the spring. And of course, nobody could have anticipated uh, the kind of school uh, disruption to schools that we saw. But you can see that uh, across the country, uh, almost two thirds of school districts offered no instruction at all. And by that, I mean, they may have uh, sent packets home. They may have communicated to districts, uh, to, to uh, families. Uh, uh, you know, here's some handouts that you can do, but in terms of instruction, uh, either live instruction or what is uh, referred to as asynchronous, where there's uh, uh, some opportunity to at least have access to live instruction, almost two thirds of schools nationally uh, weren't in a position to offer any instruction at all. Uh, less than half of districts provided grades. Uh, many didn't even track attendance. We know that in the city of Boston, uh, where there are 50,000 students, more than 20%, over 10,000 of those students, uh, never even signed into a single remote learning platform uh, in, in the spring. So we know that the impacts, particularly during that period, were, were very severe. Districts have done their best uh, to try to prioritize high needs students. And by that, I mean students uh, with uh, special needs, students with, uh, as English language uh, learners. Uh, there was an attempt both in the spring and currently to still try to prioritize those students who are most impacted uh, by not being able to be in person or in a classroom. But we know longer term that this uh, disruption is, is going to certainly 
cost us all. It's going to cost students uh, who are affected by the closure. You can see, and, and certainly it's no surprise, uh, that the student populations most impacted are, are Black and Latinx kids, uh, as well as kids from low-income families. Um, this, this should affect us all just from a social justice uh, perspective, but of course it has an economic impact uh, as well. And as has been determined, there's been a serious uh, hit uh, to uh, uh, the overall uh, economic health and vitality uh, of the nation. It's one of my, my, my favorite pictures because I have to tell you, my wife and I have one remote learner. Having four or five in one house I cannot even imagine. Uh, but the fact is that the disruption was serious. We know that on March 17th, uh, schools were closed in Massachusetts with the thought that maybe they'd reopen in a couple of weeks. Uh, and we all know that that uh, clearly didn't happen. The first priority of districts uh, like Brockton and others was to try to deal with some of the health and safety issues of students, get uh, ensure that lunches were still being uh, distributed, uh, check in on people's uh, health and safety. And that was certainly more than appropriate. But there was also a national discussion going on about whether or not any new instruction should be given. The initial guidance in Massachusetts was uh, to, uh, to the extent that schools were connecting with kids to go over old material, to reinforce old material. There was a concern uh, about uh, the constitutional rights of students who might not have devices and, and, and the like um, as to what it would mean uh, to teach new content. But when it became clear that the disruption was going to shutter schools for a, a long period of time, uh, sometime around April 28th at least, Massachusetts joined an increasing number of states uh, requiring that a new instruction uh, be taught and that a group of standards uh, was developed and put out uh, in English and in math and in science uh, that said to schools, uh, that, you know, this could be a, a quite a long period of time and we have a responsibility to make sure that these standards uh, that will help ensure that kids can make it to the next grade uh, are, are taught. Uh, unfortunately for a lot of folks, the timing was just not good to, to put out that kind of guidance in late April, early May with about five or six weeks left of school. Uh, teachers contracts not really designed to, to do more for students during the summer. Uh, uh, the spring by a lot of measures was, was a washout for schools, not just in Massachusetts, uh, but around the country. So there was certainly uh, an eye to trying to do better in the fall. Uh, and that led to uh, a whole range of, of things we'll just talk about in a minute. But you can see that things did get better a little bit over the course of the spring. This chart represents a database that MBAE did looking at the 20 largest districts in Massachusetts. Uh, and you can see on some metrics that we were following, uh, teaching new content, uh, providing, helping uh, families get Wi-Fi access or even providing devices is something that uh, most of the districts started to move uh, toward doing a better job at uh, toward the end of the spring. For the fall, uh, the, the guidance from the state, from the governor and the commissioner was to districts to uh, hopefully try to prioritize in-person instruction, but every district was asked to come up with three plans, uh, completely remote, uh, completely in-person, or a high of the two, where you might have students coming uh, in half the time, uh, which was really kind of a nod to social distancing. Uh, if you're going to try to social distance in schools, uh, some of the schools, particularly the older ones, it's very, very hard to do in-person instruction and keep kids anywhere from three to six feet apart. Um, in the state's guidance to districts for the fall, uh, they did some things that uh, uh, were recognized nationally as uh, very good. Uh, requiring that teachers interact with students. Uh, it sounds simple, but believe it or not, in a lot of places, in a lot of states, uh, that was not a requirement even uh, for instruction this fall. That they provide grades and feedback, report on attendance, uh, and of course provide uh, 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 services to students with disabilities. Some of the things the state did not do that other states did do uh, was require live instructional time. Certainly the state encouraged it, but you know, after all, Massachusetts is a New England state, and we know in New England, uh, there's an awful lot of emphasis on local control. Doesn't mean it didn't happen, uh, but there was at least no state requirement that districts provide live instructional time uh, this fall, that they assess uh, what the learning loss was, or that they have specific measures to address chronic absenteeism. But again, let me caution that many districts did that anyway, of course. In our uh, review of 120 districts, 
this fall shows, as you can see, that a lot of districts did incorporate those things uh, in their plans, uh, some a little bit more than others. Uh, it, it's still an open question as to whether or not the plans that districts submitted in August are plans that they were able to follow through on uh, throughout the fall. And so you can see, and this is as of December in terms of our review, uh, that uh, very few districts in Massachusetts are full in person, a little less than 5%. Uh, uh, they tend to be smaller districts uh, and or wealthier districts uh, where there's more space. Uh, most of the districts, 55%, uh, are, are in some form of hybrid model uh, and around 35% in remote. And that remote number will probably continue to go up. We know that, for instance, in Brockton just this week, I believe there was a vote uh, to extend remote learning into February 23rd, I think. This shows you the number of districts uh, that, whose plans uh, still don't necessarily require live instruction, which means that for a lot of students who are not in person, if they're remote or hybrid, they could be getting uh, material uh, mailed or sent to them, uh, emailed, but it's gonna be their responsibility to try to um, uh, get that work done uh, without necessarily having direct access to, um, to a teacher. Um, we're also concerned as a group of business leaders on the number of plans that don't yet speak specifically to college and career preparation or how we uh, deal with some of the disruption in that. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, certainly for how we assess. A lot of schools have said they are going to assess, uh, but uh, assessing remotely uh, may have been a real challenge for folks. Uh, Brockton's reopening plan, uh, honestly, was one of the better plans uh, that we looked at. Uh, it uh, required synchronous uh, learning. Uh, they're a little bit above average in terms of uh, requiring for remote learners 47 hours of live instruction uh, remotely uh, over the course of a two week period. Uh, access to counselors and, and meeting the social emotional needs of students. There was at least a plan to do student assessment. Uh, we didn't see that it, it mentioned specifically uh, college and career readiness or engaging disengaged students, but it doesn't mean uh, that they didn't make the effort to do that. Um, I was asked to speak briefly about charter schools. Uh, polling shows that charter schools uh, got uh, generally better grades uh, than uh, public, uh, other public schools. Uh, in a mass inc poll uh, done recently uh, that they had been doing teacher contact uh, to a greater level uh, and therefore seemed to be a little bit more prepared uh, for the school closures that happened um, and uh, four percent of students uh, statewide have left public schools this year uh, which is probably going to be an issue going forward as to whether or not students are going to go back uh, but they did go to charter schools and they did go to parochial schools uh, parochial schools made a real effort uh, this year to say that they were going to do in-person instruction. Uh, and for a lot of families, uh, they did vote with their feet in that sense uh, and move, uh, move over. Uh, teachers in Massachusetts, uh, uh, as they uh, do nationally, certainly have the right to uh, consider uh, uh, some of the risks. Uh, a survey was done that shows that in Massachusetts, about 24% of our Teachers uh, represent some high risk uh, for contracting the virus. That's the same as it is uh, nationally. Uh, our uh, average teacher age in Massachusetts is 42.4, which is at, uh, right at uh, the national average. Although we do have a higher percentage of our students who are over 55 uh, by about five or six percentage points. Uh, uh, we certainly learned that there were uh, some real issues uh, and wide disparity around teachers um, ability to teach uh, and use technology. Uh, some teachers uh, have, have adapted to it incredibly well. Um, uh, some uh, did not. Uh, many were using different platforms early on, which meant families and students had to manage uh, several platforms uh, if they were older students, middle or high school students. And collective bargaining uh, issues uh, became a, a real issue. There are some districts where teachers uh, have refused to live stream their classes uh, or um, uh, work conditions uh, are, that have limited the instructional time for students. Uh, funding, of course, it's hard to have any conversation without funding. Um, uh, we did not get first year funding of the Student Opportunity Act this year, but some of that was made up by federal funds that came in. You see here in Brockton, uh, Brockton uh, received a combination of uh, funding sources that, that gave the Brockton Public Schools about a $26 million increase uh, had there been no pandemic and we have had full funding of the Student Opportunity Act, uh, there would have been a 21 million. 
sounds like a windfall, but of course, school systems have uh, additional costs to prepare schools uh, for kids getting in. So uh, certainly not, uh, not really from that perspective. Um, I'm just gonna switch over quickly, Chris, just to talk uh, about our pro policy priorities going forward and, and how uh, uh, this chamber can help support us. Certainly, our first priority is to recover from this pandemic. Uh, to, um, uh, I mentioned the live instruction issue. Uh, the state did switch course uh, last month and start to require districts to provide live instruction, a minimum amount of live instruction as part of some new emergency regulations. Uh, I'm speaking at the, uh, the board the state board meeting on Tuesday in support of that. We certainly support that. MBAE supports continuing to give MCAS uh, exams uh, this year. That is the only way in which we can determine whether or not kids are still on track. Uh, and we think it's incredibly important to continue to do that. Um, we want to continue to set kids up for success. Early college has taken on new residents and you know institutions like Bridgewater State, which we're so lucky to have in this region and Massasoit Community College uh, are doing some of this now, but we think um, we've seen uh, some real great impacts in terms of increasing the numbers of black and Latino kids who go and persist in college through an early college program where they get college credit in high school. Uh, we think that's really important to pursue and promote. Uh, making sure that we get back to funding the Student Opportunity Act and that we do it fairly uh, that we incentivize innovation, that we do more with technology and teach kids uh, digital literacy so that uh, uh, you know, we can uh, not only forestall impacts from any future pandemics, but make sure our kids are computer ready for a new technological society uh, and continue to lead on, on reform efforts. We have to continue to have high standards. We can't just throw up our hands and say, well, nobody could have planned on this. So we're just gonna uh, pick up from here and move forward. We've got to have high standards for all students if we're going to have an equitable society. So we ask uh, for the chamber's support for those policy priorities. I'm happy to answer any questions that folks have, but thank you for the opportunity. That was great, Ed. Thanks. Think, thank you think, very much, Ed. Do we, do we have any questions posted, Chris, at all? Uh, yeah, there was one about MCAS uh, as to the debate around that, or, or is there any pushback? Does it look like they're going to be administered or? So, uh, uh, Commissioner Riley, two weeks ago, uh, came out with an announcement that we fully support, uh, where uh, you know he believes and agrees that uh, we do need to uh, do MCAS this year. It's going to be a more limited version of MCAS uh, because of, of everything that's going on. So it'll be about half the test. It makes it a little bit less reliable statistically statewide, but it's still going to provide some great information to parents. Uh, about where their kids are at. If you're a parent and, and your kid takes MCAS, hopefully you've seen the report that comes home. It gives you great information about what your kid has learned in English and, and math and what they haven't yet, yet learned. Uh, and uh, the commissioner, I think correctly said he's, you know, there's no plan to use this year's MCAS results for accountability purposes, for teacher evaluations, for designating schools. This is really just to collect diagnostic information. Oh, oh. Students. Or graduation, and and they're going to alter the graduation requirement. So, uh, already about ninety six percent of the class of twenty twenty one has already passed MCAS. Oh, because uh, they get four or five chances to pass it, right? Oh, okay. It's starting in the tenth grade, if a student is scheduled to graduate uh, in June and they still have yet to pass MCAS, they're going to offer an alternative. Uh, where they take a course with the same content, if they pass the course, uh, they'll be able to graduate. So they did alter that for this year as well, Chris. Great question. Uh, okay. And what about uh, are the is the teacher union okay with this? Are they are they uh, supportive of it, knowing that there's been some provisions put in there? Or? The, the, te the, the teachers union said they 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 thought it was a good step. They they prefer to um, they prefer to have it eliminated entirely. So we do have a. You know, we still have a bit of a fundamental disagreement uh, over the years. Uh, teachers, the statewide teachers unions, even though they supported MCAS in 93 as part of the bill, no. um, have started to you know, grow in opposition to okay. it. Uh, as you can appreciate that, you know, that it's an understandable union position from the perspective that to the extent that MCAS now has gotten so sophisticated, you can reasonably 
determine which teachers are advancing student growth better than other teachers. Yeah, okay, I see that concern. It's more of a union issue. It's not, I don't want to call it a teacher issue, it's a union. Yeah. Okay. Uh, see, but so we feel strongly that you need that information. You can't have high standards if you don't ever measure whether or not uh, we're teaching kids those standards. So there's a question from uh, Fred Clark, who you know uh, is the president sure. hey, of uh, Bridgewater. Uh, great to see you, Ed, he says. One of uh, Bridgewater State University's priorities is to increase the number of teachers of color that are willing to teach in gateway cities. A small number of teachers of color in diverse classrooms is staggeringly low. Uh, is there an issue that you might partner uh, with you on, uh, Fred? Don't tell Fred, I'll, I'll call him as soon as I get off. Okay. <laughs> All right, no, it's a, it's uh, it's a, it's an incredibly important issue. He's he's absolutely right on that. Uh, you know, I'm an alum of of um, Bridgewater. I got uh, uh, an MED there that that uh, you know uh, I I used in education, the educational field. They are well positioned to help with this, and uh, that is just uh, so right, particularly in this moment that we're all living in. Uh, students need to know, they need to see people who look like themselves uh, in schools. And he is absolutely correct, particularly the, the employment challenges in the gateway cities uh, in terms of, of attracting good young talent uh, uh, where you've got uh, so many majority minority schools. Uh, the diversity of a teaching staff can make a huge difference. Um, so uh, I completely agree. I think there's some great uh, opportunity for the business community to partnership on that partner on that issue. Thank you. So one, one last question, and that was relative to uh, there was a slide in there talk about the earnings being uh, impacted pretty severely for students that may have a hiccup here in learning. That's kind of demoralizing a little bit. Is there is there data to put us back on a pathway or to give those students at some point a chance to catch up or advance yeah, and how will employers be able to deal with yeah. Kids great question. That's a great question. The, 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 you know, that, that data assumes that the student won't recover that lost learning. Okay. Um, uh, so it's not an assumption that we feel we should live with. So I, I would offer these three quick and practical suggestions. Business leaders in different communities should ask their school system, have you assessed where kids are at? There are assessment systems. One is called MAP. One is called iReady. These tests are usually given in September and January and the like, and they can be given remotely. My student's a remote learner, but he got his, he's had his two cycle of MAP testing. And it can tell you how much learning has been lost and exactly how to, you know, what they need to learn to recover. Okay. The, ways to, the ways to recover are small group instructions. It's not going to be cheap. The new federal money that's coming in really should be devoted to small group instruction, something that's called intensive tutoring. One-on-one -on -one tutoring, even if it's via Zoom, can make a huge difference to get kids back on track. Accelerated programs, and quite honestly, we should all be thinking about this summer and renegotiating collective bargaining agreements to extend this school year. If we get vaccines and kids can get back in person by May and June, only for us to send them home for 10 weeks, we're losing a huge opportunity. So. Yes, we, we can identify what they need by assessing them. We can invest in programs that get them back on track. And then hopefully we can have a, an even better system, more infused with technology going forward. And that's a longer term goal. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much, Ed. Thanks, um, Joe. Thanks, Chris. I'd like to thank the audience for participating today's call. Uh, we had an outstanding turnout. So thank you all for participating. Uh, Chris, uh, would you like to uh, go on with the rest of the information or should we just wrap up? Uh, sure, I mean, you can, yeah, I mean, we have, well, I'll tell you, I'll, yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> we have some up, updated uh, upcoming information or, or sessions that are gonna be very helpful to folks, including having uh, Eli and Margaret and Susan back, so. Yes, so we have January 26th and 28th, Seed Corporation Basic Entrepreneurial Workshop at 10 o'clock. February 5th, we have a business assistant Zoom call with the mayor, um, MOBD and SBA at two o'clock. February 18th, we have a multi-chamber multi mega mixer at five o'clock. And March 5th and 6th, annual multicultural business forum at two o'clock. 
So for more information or to register for those events, please email Lexi and uh, she can put her information into the chat box. Appreciate it. Thank you to our sponsor, Trinity Development and Management. I want to wish you all a great weekend. Thank you for participating. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Sure. Thank you, panelists.